Actually, I have to admit that at the time we did not give it much thought. If it weren't for those silly thoughts about our activities in this country, I would have a wonderful time on this mission. I've already told you about the shooting. Of course, I did not want to fail at this job either. War crimes, nicht schuldig. Crimes against humanity, nicht schuldig im Sinne der Anklage. The killing of defenseless civilians, nicht schuldig. Persecutions on political, racial and religious grounds, nicht schuldig. Extermination, nicht schuldig im Sinne der Anklage. Genocide, nicht schuldig. Murder, nein, nicht schuldig. And when I got to Nuremberg, as a prosecutor by chance, but we found the Einsatzgruppe and the Aragnus Meldungen aus der UDSSR, reports from the Eastern Front. Clear case of mass murder, unparalleled in human history. Uh, 3,000 men, the men you're talking about, went out and every day, every day, they murdered large numbers of people, including helpless, innocent children. To fathom evil, a series of tests were conducted with the defendants during the Nuremberg trials. The Rorschach test. A subject is shown cards with ink black patterns and asked to interpret the images. The psychiatrist analyzes the subject based on these interpretations. The results from Nuremberg are too disturbing to be published. The Nazi criminals who were tested are psychologically sound and completely normal men. The notion that mass killers are wild beasts, which exists among many of the public, kill them all. These are wild animals. How could they do such a thing? It's absolutely false. The mass killers are people just like you and me who are doing what they think is necessary for the general welfare. To this day, I can remember Major Trapp pacing back and forth with his hands on his back. He somehow seemed depressed. Essentially, he said, hell, operations like these are not my kind of thing, but orders are orders. He announced we had to carry out an execution in the village ahead and made it very clear that it was Jews we were meant to kill. During his speech, he reminded us to think of our wives and children at home who were suffering from the air raids. In particular, we should think about all the women and children who had lost their lives during the bombing raids. Thinking about these facts would make it easier to carry out our orders during the operation ahead. Major Trapp said the operation was not at all to his liking, but he had received the order from way up. I asked myself how it was possible that civilians were shot. Today, I can't remember in detail what was said about that matter. No one dared to say anything. Inwardly, I did not agree. We stood there as white as snow. At the end of his speech, the Major asked the older soldiers in the battalion whether there were any among them who didn't feel up to carrying out the mission. At first, no one had the courage to speak up. Finally, I was the only one who stepped forward, thus indicating that I was one of those not being fit for the job. After that, other comrades came forward as well. There were about 10 to 12 of us. We were instructed in so far as we could refuse the order to participate in special operations without any adverse consequences. Everyone must have heard that you were allowed to step forward because I heard it too. I must admit that I didn't have the guts to refuse the order. 
it is peer pressure to the nth degree. Yeah, you, you, you're separated from home. You're separated from everyone else. There is nobody but you and your unit. You don't all go home at the end of the day and go back to your family. You don't read the morning newspaper and, and take the commute to work. This is your life. These people are everything. And, and if you fail them, they will die. And if they fail you in combat, it, 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 they will die. And so here we are, bound to degrees that beyond what most people can comprehend, the brotherhood of war. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. There's an unpleasant task that all of them have to do. Um, I can refuse, but if I refuse, then all my friends and, and colleagues, they have to do more of it. Uh, so I, I think we can look back and wish that every, every man there had said, no, I'm not going to do it, and all had refused. And then who knows what, <laughs> what would have happened. Uh, but uh, no one wants to step forward and say, well, I'm too good for this. The rest of you better do it. One could say, I am unable to do this. With the implication, it's one's own shortcoming. And one might be quickly transferred because they didn't want to interfere with the killing machinery. One could never say, I'm against this. It's wrong. I condemn you. That would be... Uh, a, a, a death knell. I was worried that it might be bad for me in the future if I appeared to be too soft. I didn't want others to get the impression I was not as tough as a man is supposed to be. I had to worry Leiderwitz and the others would think I was a wimp. I assumed that if I asked him to be exempted from executions, I would have been on his blacklist and my promotion would have been at risk or totally out of the question. A commander who would have presented himself as being too soft for this sort of thing certainly would have disqualified himself for any duties of leadership. Well, I must admit that nobody wanted to be seen as a coward. I thought I would be able to cope with the matter. And with or without me, the Jews would not be able to escape their fate. For us policemen, the motto was, what benefits the state is just, what harms the state is unjust. What I'm trying to say is that it never crossed my mind that the orders might be wrong. I followed those orders because they came from the leaders of our country, not because I was scared. I know it is the duty of the police to protect innocent people, but at the time I was convinced that Jewish people were not innocent, but guilty. Today I can no longer say what I thought at the time or if I thought anything at all. I can't say if I was influenced by the propaganda to refuse to carry out the order I had received. I must say that we didn't think about it at all at the time. Only years later did you really become aware of what happened back then. That means the idea never occurred to me that you should refuse or evade the orders to, um, to, to participate in the extermination of the Jews. I'd never learned anything else but to unconditionally obey orders I was given. God heavens, damn it. One generation has to bear the burden so that our children will have a better life. The Ash Conformity Experiment. A subject is led into a room where a group of people are already waiting. The subject is told that the others are volunteers as well. In reality, they are actors. The group is shown a line on a card with three comparison lines alongside it. The task is to estimate which lines are of the same length. As arranged, the actors unanimously give wrong answers to some of the exercises. On the average, 37% of the subjects agree with the obviously incorrect answer. In, in psychology, we tend to depict conformity as, as a bad thing in situations like this where many people are, uh, are, are killed and you know, should have thought for themselves to, to act differently. But in the bigger picture, conformity is mostly a benefit, is mostly a good thing. Humans, we evolved to survive and reproduce by banding together in groups and working together and uh, sharing projects and sharing responsibilities. So conforming to the group is a way to be accepted in the group. It is vitally important to humans, especially back in the evolutionary past, to be accepted in the group, to be part of it. If you're alone, you have very little chance of surviving. Conformity is a tricky word. Um, 
because it does mean in some degree the necessary structures that one must um, be part of and uh, adhere to in any society or culture and it also has the uh, implication of um, of obedience to that which exists Certainly for Eastern Poland and the Western parts of the, of the Soviet Union, this is the demographic center of European Jewry. Uh, and many of these towns uh, in the territories that the, the Germans occupy after June 1941, uh, the towns will be over half Jewish. One day I, I asked uh, somebody in, in Viv, uh, where were living the Jews? And people, they laugh and say, where were living the non-Jews? And uh, we didn't realize effectively in, uh, in, uh, in Western Ukraine, what's uh, called Yiddish land, uh, Jews were not in a small corner. There was not a street of Jews. They were among the people. They were factories, they were uh, opera, they were uh, spectacles, they were restaurants. They were a people in the people. And so for us it's very difficult to imagine because we classify Jews as a minority. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Ideological training was also carried out. I remember that the relationship of Jewry to Bolshevism was taught as a subject. By the way, the movie Yud Zeus was shown to the battalion in Radom. We drove off to take a look at the city of Kizhnev in daylight. Now we were able to see the scale of destruction, ruins upon ruins, rubble upon rubble, misery and squalor. A once flourishing city had been turned into one gigantic ruin. In Kiev, for example, there is one explosion after another caused by mines. The city has been burning for eight days. The Jews did it all. The Jews and the Bolsheviks, mainly the Jews, had destroyed everything. Recently, one of our comrades was found murdered at night in the forest. He was stabbed in the back. It must have been the Jew. The snipers are really dangerous. Yesterday, a commander of an SS regiment was shot. They said the murderer was a Jew. You can imagine how something like that cries out for revenge. But then again, it is also carried out. It must be the Jew who is behind all this. He wants to destroy us and afterwards reign over the ruins of the world. That must not happen no matter what. He doesn't seem like a fighter. Instead, he stirs up hatred in the background, pulls all the strings, and that's why he's difficult to fight. In the process, he exploits all means and all people. It doesn't matter if they are Catholics, Bolsheviks, Protestants. We know that all those crooks are Freemasons and therefore devoted to, or to put it in a better way, slaves of international jury. What a shame that I couldn't join this operation against these scoundrels. It would have been a joy to see my machine gun smoking. We cannot and must not lose this war, because then we Germans would be hopelessly lost. The Jews will assail us and eradicate everything that is German. There would be a horrific and gruesome massacre. 
Their guilt is overwhelming. The suffering they cause is staggering. Their murders are diabolical. It can only be atoned for by their destruction. I used to reject this attitude as being immoral. But after this presentation of the Soviet paradise, I cannot see any other solution. To deal with a situation appropriately, one completely eliminates personal feelings of any kind by carrying out the work ruthlessly and without mercy. This struggle must be fought to the utmost and must be fought to the bitter end. Then the world will find eternal peace. There's only one thing for the Jews. Extermination. Many genocides have long historic conflict behind them. The Tutsis and the Hutus in Burundi had had earlier conflicts, and certainly in Rwanda. Uh, and one can see that there was an inherent conflict between Armenians wanting more and more autonomy and the Turks losing other parts of their empire, feeling that they had to draw their line somewhere. That is, these are not fantasized conflicts. They don't justify genocide, but they are not fantas in fantasized conflicts. The conflict of the Third Reich against the Jew is a totally imaginary conflict. This is just made up as a, as a fantasy of Hitler's imagination and of others. And it's that utter disparity between the Jews, for the most part, who certainly in Germany were the most loyal of Germans imaginable, and the harmlessness of the Jewish populations elsewhere to what was attributed to them and what was done to them seems to me starker and more disparate than almost any genocide I can think of. And I call it a biomedical vision, biomedical vision on the part of the Nazis. And that biomedical vision said, uh, and Hitler wrote this in Mein Kampf and it was picked up in other ways, the Nordic race had been strong and dominant and is the only culture-creating race. All other races, except the, quotes Jewish race, are culture-sustaining races, possibly, but can't create culture, and, quotes the Jewish race, so-called, was a culture-destroying race, which had infected the Nordic race, rendered it weak, and therefore had to be destroyed. So the whole project was a healing project, and in a way, even the invasion by armies and the case, the case for living space, I think, is all secondary to this biological vision or fantasy. And there becomes, there takes part a reversal of healing and killing, because you are killing to heal. You kill the Jews or other inferior races in order to heal the Nordic race. triumphant in Poland, triumphant in France, uh, blessed with victory, uh, flushed with victory. Uh, it, it, it's madness to think that everything I know and everybody I know is, is wrong. Uh, my nation, the, the people who, who raised Hitler to power, the, the Nazi party, my armed forces, my leadership, all of them are, are wrong. There's a kind of enormous triumphalism and that triumphalism can carry you uh, into a realm of transcendence. One is omnipotent, you know, uh, and the killing can feed that and also be fed by it. There's always an attraction also to killing. There's an attraction to war because it removes one from what might be called the banalities of everyday life.
Our battalion physician had to explain how to fire to induce the immediate death of the victim. I remember vividly how he traced the outline of a human body, at least from the shoulders up, for the demonstration and, and then precisely described the point where the fixed bayonet should be placed as a guide. was in my mouth and I was trembling so badly I found it difficult to aim. When the other comrades shot at the Jews lying on the ground, I did it too. Standing about two meters behind my victim, I aimed at the neck and fired. I personally took part in about ten shootings. I had to kill men and women. Then I just couldn't fire at people anymore. My squad leader noticed because at the end I kept missing. For that reason he replaced me. Other comrades were also replaced sooner or later because they just couldn't go on. When I had to fire at these defenseless people for the first time, I thought of home, my children. Because there were also children among those people. I was among the marksmen too, but I was only able to fire about five times. I began to feel sick. It was like in a dream. During the shooting, I felt so sick I had to throw up. Afterwards, they laughed at me because I wasn't able to shoot anymore. What are we doing? What are we doing? There was no way to avoid some of my comrades noticing that I didn't go along with the execution and fire shots at the victims. As a result, they made comments about me like bastard, gutless, and so on. Killing the man was so abhorrent to me that it did not hit the fourth man. It was simply no longer possible for me to aim accurately. I was suddenly filled with nausea and ran away from the execution site. I then ran into the forest. I had to throw up and sat against a tree. I think I spent about two to three hours alone in the forest. What we had to experience was much too much for a human being. When the layers grew higher, we had to walk on the corpses. Our boots were besmirched with blood. It was gruesome to feel the dead bodies under your boots. We are expected to deal with this awful mess. We are soldiers and want to fight in battle, but not carry out this. It was horrible. After that execution, I had time off, three to four hours. During that period, alcohol was served rum, I believe. Each marksman received roughly a quarter liter of alcohol. The alcohol was just enough to overcome a certain feeling of nausea. Upon our return, I still remember that none of my comrades enjoyed our meal, but instead we consumed plenty of alcohol, which we received in special rations. It seemed like the men were totally exhausted. That evening I went through the barracks again and talked to individual members of the company. Some people were no longer approachable, especially those who had been deployed as marksmen in the 4th platoon. I thought about it and came to the conclusion that the whole thing was a real disgrace. I felt bitter about the fact that we had become pigs and murderers, especially since we had been trained to be decent human beings in the barracks. We had to do the dirty work. Deep in my heart, I had been an officer, namely an officer who upheld the ideals of the old Prussian tradition. My world fell apart. And from that point on, they're trapped. Because the more horrific acts they commit, the more they are invested in believing that their leaders are right and their nation is right. You have to believe what I did was right, what I did was proper. And you wait for punishment. I mean, over your shoulder, you're saying, there must be punishment coming. I've committed this evil act. There must be punishment from somewhere. But the punishment never comes. And everybody says what you did was right.
When I learn of incidents such as the massacre of millions of men, women, and children perpetrated by the Nazis in World War II, I don't think of these as impersonal historical happenings. Rather, I see them as real events mediated by human beings just like you and me. How is it possible, I ask myself, that ordinary people, who are courteous and decent in everyday life, can act callously, inhumanely, without any limitations of conscience? The Milgram Experiment. A subject is asked to give electric shocks to punish another participant, in reality an actor, for false answers. The intensity of the electric shock is meant to be increased after each mistake. An experimenter gives orders. At a certain point, the supposed victim screams in pain and begs to stop the experiment. If the subject has any doubts about what he is doing, the experimenter initially says, please continue. Then, the experiment requires that you continue. Then, it is absolutely essential that you continue. Then, you have no choice, you must go on. All subjects go beyond the point where they hear loud screams, when the victim starts begging, when the victim suddenly no longer responds. 67% of the participants give the supposed learner electric shocks of maximum strength, which they know could be deadly. It's an incremental process by which perpetrators do more and more step by step. There's a shocking beginning uh, that's like a, uh, an introduction to the whole process, an initiation. And then incrementally one takes one step after another so that one couldn't have taken a full plunge into the extremity. Once they had crossed the threshold, uh, then the emotional reaction to what they're doing becomes increasingly less traumatic, increasingly more routine. Uh, and that while they could describe their feelings and their reaction to the first massacre, as one goes further into the killing, they remember fewer and fewer details. They can't keep the different massacres apart. Um, human beings really are, are designed psychologically uh, to adapt to things. Uh, so extreme experiences, uh, we, we grow accustomed to them and they, be, they become more routine. It is surprising how, how far it went with, you'd think that killing someone would always continue uh, to be troubling and upsetting. Uh, that, in a sense, to me, is one of the scariest things I found in my research, was how quickly people became used to what they were doing, how quickly it became normal. Things weren't that strict. They ask, who wants to shoot? We need some guys. Usually a few members of the second company volunteered by stepping forward or raising their hand and saying, someone has to do it. Later on, after the men had gotten used to the bloodbath, there were always enough volunteers. Not being able to see dead people is a weakness that is best overcome by going there more often. It then becomes a habit. The last day of September gave us sunny weather again. We marched in a long line into a beautiful valley, framed on both sides by colorful autumn forests. The light brown meadows lay along the broad stream, flowing over large stones and boulders. I, I would say the fact that I am a good person, I am a normal person, these make it possible for me to do these bad things. Uh, it, it is not that you split your personality. I'm just another person who's leading a normal life, doing a dirty job, and these normal things empower me. A and they are symbols that my society says what I'm doing is right. They are indicators, uh, tokens, uh, manifestations of the support of my civilization for what I do. Uh, this, is not, this is not a dichotomy in which you split your life in two parts. It is the yin and the yang. It is, it is the one supporting the other and making the other possible. We usually marched out as a platoon, combed the village by going from door to door, brought out the entire population and drove them to the main square. With the support of a local, it was determined who was a Jew. Then the non-Jewish inhabitants were sent back. We look for the right location for execution and burial. After a few minutes, we have found something. The condemned line up with spades to dig their own graves. 
two of them are crying. The others definitely show incredible courage. What must be going on in their minds at this very moment? I believe each of them has a little hope that they will not be shot. We drove to the execution site around 4 o'clock in the morning. The killing took about three hours. Of course, we also had to feel the ditch. That was rather long. I think we were finished with everything at around 8 o'clock. Most of the time is taken up by digging the ditches, whereas the shooting itself happens quickly. 100 men, 40 minutes. It's strange. I don't feel anything at all. No mercy, nothing. That's the way it is and that's that. The moon came up. Single stars were shining. A bright fog hung in the meadows. The trees stood dark and gloomy. Sleeping very deeply, I was suddenly woken up at six o'clock in the morning. Line up for an execution. Okay then, let's be executioner and grave digger again. Strange. You love fighting, but then you have to shoot down defenseless people. Company party to celebrate the battalion's second anniversary. Nice afternoon, but then unfortunately unpleasant building. On the whole, I was shooting for roughly one or two hours. When asked how many Jews I killed, I, I cannot be exact. Perhaps 50 or 100? Can't remember. Men, women, children, all wiped out. The Jews will be totally exterminated. Dear Heidi, don't start worrying about it. It has to be done. That day, the executions must have lasted until roughly five or six in the evening. There was schnapps later. We were young soldiers at the time. We didn't think about why the Jews were being shot. In fact, we complained for the simple reason alone that we had to clean our weapons afterwards. What is hard to grasp and hard to picture is that the killing went on day after day, village by village, town by town, in which units went from one place to another, uh, and this was their day-to-day -day job. What, what was difficult to understand is how these people could, uh, they were young, we have pictures of killers who are very young, and they succeeded to stand during some time two, three years shooting everyday people. So that's really surprising. This morning I learned we can write, and there's a good chance mail will actually be delivered. While listening to some amazingly sensual music, I'm now writing the first letter to my Toda. As I write this letter, we're told to get our things together. Firing squad with steel helmet and rifle, 30 rounds of ammunition. We just came back. 500 Jews stood in line for execution. Beforehand, we went to see the murdered German airmen. About five weeks ago, I put the first of 600 up against the wall. Since then, we've wiped out another 200 or so in a mopping up operation. Then, in another mission, about 1,000 more. And in between, in, in the last eight days, I've had 2,000 Jews and 200 gypsies, shot in accordance with the 1 to 100 ratio for brutishly murdered German soldiers. Another 2,200, almost exclusively Jews, will be executed during the next eight days. Well, that's everything but a nice job. Waited all morning for our dentist. Only got treated in the afternoon. Had to have the filling replaced. The dentist works with the most primitive equipment, but it helps. We sought to clear the prison by the end of each month, enabling us to report greater numbers to the command of operations in Mogiev. I don't care much for killing defenseless people, even if they are only Jews. I prefer honest, open combat. Well then. Good night, my dearest bunny.
most of the murders are committed in the summer because mass graves cannot be dug in frozen earth. For example, Bibrica. Вас вітає колишній бібський міський голова Юрій Івасків. Місто Бібрика по кількості населення є одним із найменших на Україні, але одночасно з тим воно має славну багатовікову історичну традицію. До 1939 року місто нараховувало 5900 жителів. Із них 2000 українців, 2000 населення євреїв і 1850 населення було польської народності. Місто мало славні традиції, і ми місто надзвичайно мирно співіснували всі три конфесії. Життя процвітало, життя було насиченим. Центр. Ну то що тут центр? Люди ходили з ними, торгували. Я беру за той галю. От от вон було. Була, Там та. було, розумієте, цей, можна сказати, буква О. Я вже розказав з ними. І дівкора був у магазині з одної сторони, з другої сторони. А в середині був такий вхід. Там була посуда, там була обув, там розтканина була. Що хто хотів, там можна було, тільки щоб на гроші було, то він себе там забезпечив. Були євреї, так вони були кравці. І ми батько вчився якраз. Євреї. Та, але було більше їх. І за один за другим всюди закривали, в п'ятницю. А ви розповідали, що в суботу євреї навіть не могли собі піч розпалити. Так, 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 так. Я сам на дві Так, так. Іди сюди. Що таке? Не маю серця, не спалею його. Так, так. Дав там два гроші. Два гроші тут були. Були такі. За нами знаходиться синагога. Всі вулиці, які прилягали до синагоги, в 42-му році були обнесені колючим дротом і було, було утворено гетто, в якому е, утримувалися декілька сотень євреїв. Гетто починалося, тут є річка, і зараз за річкою були витягнуті дроти. І дроти обтягували... Тут, де були єврейські будинки, то був обтягнутий дротами. Так само і в центру міста, до тротуару. Вже ходити туди не можна було. Як ходив я до школи, то ходив кругом. Кругом гетто обходив. Хтось з ваших колишніх там друзів, школи, були такі люди, що з вами вчилися? Були, були хлопці молоді. Один прекрасний день, розумієте, був, розумієте, рано, я йшов до сестри, то сестра моя взяла, правда, вивели, розумієте, колону і до Глібу очвели, розумієте. До Глібу ж на вагони, і там є таке місто Белц, і там її стратили, розумієте. Пане Ярославе, розкажіть, будь ласка, те, що ви бачили, живучи тут, в цьому будинку, в 42-му році? Ну, я бачив. Велико довго колонок, дуже багато було. Євреї вели, з боків солдати. Підганяли, діти, діти були з своїми тими речами, що внесли. Вони були, напевно, і стомлені тої люди. Я бачу, як вони йшли і все підганялися. Ну, варто так. Ну, як кажуть, що їх гнали до, до стації, і там на Белджа їх вели. А тут недалеко зараз були. Корчма вона далеко, третій mm. дім. Також ну, єврейська така, також забрали. Mm. One day a vehicle of the Wehrmacht with a loudspeaker was driven through Shitomir. Over the loudspeaker the announcement was made in German and Russian that at a specific time that day Jews were to be shot on the market square, something like that. Since I had the day off, I went to the market square at the appropriate time, and I got there, I saw 50, 60 Jews guarded by the SS. 
Then it was announced over the loudspeakers that people should follow to the executions. After a while, we saw numerous soldiers and civilians heading for rail embankment ahead of us. Beyond, we were told executions were taking place continuously. Once we climbed up the embankment, we were confronted with a sight of gruesome atrocity which shocked and horrified an unprepared onlooker. There were countless soldiers of units stationed in the area, lounging around as spectators, some in swimming trunks, as well as numerous civilians with women and children. Access to the execution site was restricted by a wall. The entrance was a high iron barred gate which was locked. As a result, I couldn't get inside anymore. Island stood in front of the gate with other soldiers and civilians looking through the bars to the execution site. It was about 80 meters away. I could see about nine girls or women kneeling in front of a deep ditch. Some of the marksmen were splattered with blood. At the time, it was not curiosity that drove me to watch. It was actually a disbelief that something like that could happen. In, a, in one interview with somebody, she was in a class in a small village of Belarus, I think, and um, the director of the school gathered all the children and said, tomorrow there is no class because we kill our enemies. And so I said, you can go to see and you will say what you saw the day after in the school. And she said, we gathered all the children together and we went near the mouse grave, so they knew the place. And she said, uh, it was too early. The Germans were not here and the Jews were not here. So she said we were waiting, sitting under a tree, until it began. And so all the school was watching, and we came back at night. And the day after, it was the course of the day. The Genovese syndrome, or bystander effect. In 1964, 29-year-old Kitty Genovese is assaulted and raped in the courtyard of an apartment house. The perpetrator leaves the scene. After 20 minutes, he returns abuses his victim again, and then kills her. Evidently, 38 inhabitants of the surrounding houses observe the entire incident. Nobody calls the police. Nobody helps. The more bystanders observing an incident, the lower the probability that someone will intervene. In the same way, bystanders who stand there and watch uh, a mass, mass murder without saying anything, uh, could be giving a lot, giving off uh, the impression that the, uh, even unconsciously, that the perpetrators will see and say uh, to themselves unconsciously that uh, I guess there's nothing wrong. When they did have bystanders there, certainly that was an effort to normalize it and routinize it as something that is done, must be done, and has its good reasons. And the more it's surrounded by uh, uh, an atmosphere of normality. Uh, the more uh, it would prevent you from questioning it and saying, wait, wait, this is wrong. I should not be taking part in this. Uh, someone should be objecting. I should be objecting. I should scream that this is wrong. The killers made it public to give a justification, like you make a public death condemnation in America or in another country. It's public because it was legal. So the fact effectively that we come reinforced the legality of the crime. Back in Bibrica, Josip witnessed one of the many smaller executions. Mm-hmm. 
чотири кроки, чотири на чотири, і купали два метри глибоко. І зробили такі, наче, таку сходку. Сходки, розумієте, і все. І тепер гайда, і нас вигнали от там на вогу. От там на того дерева, щоб не вийде. І дивимося, якраз ведуть групу одну. І вони роздівалися, сказали їм роздіватися. Ті всі одяг на бік. І самі лягали, розуміють, казали, лягати, розуміються, не по сходах йшли туди вниз, лягати лицем до землі. А ті, які ступавши з гори, стріляли, розуміють, з карабінів. Карабіни в них було, розуміють, з карабіни стріляли. Одну групу туди, ми трошечки потім нас накликали сюди, присипали, розуміють, другу групу привели, другу групу. Такі саме, розумієте, стріляли. І через них, розумієте, була вона дитина 4 роки мала. І цей, не на якій велику нашій вулиці, то до іного там сусід такий був, до іного і каже, Михайло, він знав той єврей, його добре, Михайло, прощай, де вже більше не зобачимо, розумієте, і вони їх повели. Ось така справа, розумієте, все. А що розумієте це? То шкода було, шкода саме було в цій дитині, розумієте. Воно ще могло жити, розумієте, не тільки що наше, розумієте. А це були молоді, правда, були старі, старі були молоді, розумієте, а молодим, а саме дитина, то саме скорше, саме гірше було, розумієте, шкода її, розумієте. Зараз ми знаходимося в околицях села Волове, яке розташоване від Бібрики на відстані трохи більше трьох кілометрів біля парафіяльного цвинтаря, який існував вже багато століть. Організовано було так, що вантажними автомобілями із гетто певними партіями довозили сюди безпосередньо на місце страти цих людей. Чергова партія вже була приготовлена, а такий був конвейер. Тих, що вимордували тут, зараз за хвильку привозилася нова партія, знову там євреїв, які продовжувалися. Екзекуція тривала дуже довгий період, тому що не можна було так швидко позбавити всіх життя. І ці постріли були відчутні і в Шпильчино, і на Воловому. А скільки приблизно людей єврейської національності були вбиті нацистами в час Другої світової війни з Біберка? Ну, це та кількість населення, що було дві тисячі, згідно наших статистичних даній, ніхто з них не вижив. Після 44-го року, коли вже прийшли другий раз сюди, вже не було ні однієї єврейської родини. Альбо були вивезені, альбо були замордовані, розстріляні на цьому місці. The Germans arrived very early in the morning, normally before the rise of the sun, and already everything is prepared. Already the ghetto is surrounded, already the carts are waiting to take the suits or the Jews, already the police are here, and so, and when they leave at the evening, all the Jews are dead. So what was very organized is to succeed to introduce a tempo in a village where there was no tempo, Uh, but in one day the whole community was shot. In a few cases, they could not do it. In big cities, of course, so they sent people back to the ghetto in some cities and to come back the day after. But normally, in one day, they shoot a village. I drove out each time to see for myself if everything was done properly. For example, it happened that the SD fired into the lines with machine guns, thus not killing people immediately. I made sure that the execution were conducted according to specifications with a shot in the neck. I personally checked the procedure of the operation about one hour after it began, to make certain that no atrocities took place. I am certain I aimed properly and hit accordingly as instructed. At first the German machine gun was used and later the Russian machine gun. The German guns had failed. Of course, single shots were possible with the German machine gun, but usually they got hot because they were fired so often that they gave sustained fire even when set to single shots. That's why we fell back on Russian guns. The firing squad was at the trench, perhaps about 10 men, who took turns shooting. So half the group fired, while the other half stepped back and got the 08 pistols they were using ready for the next round. 
Not far away from the trench, there were perhaps five policemen who were busy reloading empty magazines. A group of Jews were lined up at the edge of the trench. There must have been about 10 to 12. They stood with their faces toward the marksmen. There was one marksman for each Jew. Then the platoon leader from the Waffen-SS gave the order to fire. The victims fell backwards into the trench. When it was noticed that many of the victims didn't die straight away, the execution method was changed. A meeting was held. At the meeting it was discussed that this method of execution was unbearable for victim and marksmen. The reason was, when shot in the heart, about 25% were not hit properly, in my opinion. When shot in the head, not only did the victims have to face the marksmen, but also roughly 5% were not fatally wounded. I cannot remember if during the conversation the legitimacy of killing Jews in general was discussed. Inside the mind of most healthy members of most species is a powerful resistance against killing your own kind. Uh, animals with antlers and horns, they fight each other head to head in the most harmless fashion. Uh, against any other species, they go to the side, they cut, they go, they go for the kill. Studies show that only 15 to 20 percent of all soldiers can overcome their reluctance to kill enemy soldiers. Military leaders have always tried to reduce this inhibition. Most of us have been red with rage at one time or another. Most of us at one time in our life have been completely out of control with anger. But at the moment of truth, we didn't kill. We didn't go for the throat. We didn't go for the eyes. We didn't grab that, that knife off the table and stab. Why? Because when we become frightened, when we become angry, the forebrain shuts down, the midbrain takes over, and we slam head on into that resistance. And, and in World War II, we discovered the existence of that resistance. And we learned that the way to overcome it was through training. The behavior of the individual soldier is determined by his character, military training, most recent combat experience, and propaganda. And you become trapped in this process in which you must believe the propaganda. Uh, otherwise, these, these horrible acts that you're committing, either these people are truly inhuman and deserving of their fate, or I am an evil person doing evil things. Absolution and legitimization by the group the soldier identifies with. Uh, it, it, the military is very powerful, it, taking away any individuality, uh, stripping away the sense of the individual and creating the sense of the group. Uniforms, uh, every warrior society had distinctive haircuts. Uh, the, the Spartans had the dreadlocks, the Romans were into high and tight, the Mongols had the forelock, the samurai had the top knot. You know, uh, during the Civil War in America, we were the Taliban. It was all about the beard, you know, and now we're back to high and tight. It doesn't matter what your hair looks like. What matters is submission to authority. And so in uniform, in hair, we stand out. We're different. We're distinctive. And that creates this, this pseudo-speciation in which we become a, a, a subspecies, all of our own, and we bond with our pack. A legitimate commander's order, clear-cut authoritarian structures. You know, the firing squad is the ultimate example of diffusion of responsibility. You know, the, the orders come from on high, and it's their fault. And the commander says I have to do it, and it's his fault. And the sergeant is making me do it, and it's his fault. And all you have to do is just press the trigger. That's, that's the only thing you have to do. Everything else has been done for you. All the thinking has been done. All the rationalization has been done. And of course, that doesn't exist by itself. It comes from a lifetime of obedience. Physical and emotional distance, for example, through dehumanization. Participants of the execution squads kill at close range. There is no great physical distance. There's very close range. So what you got to do is create psychological distance. Uh, one of the things we do is, is undress them. So they're not wearing clothing, they're, they're like animals. And we turn them around so you don't have to look in their face, you don't have to look in their eyes. Uh, it's so much easier to kill people when you don't have to see their faces. That's the pursuit mode. You know, throughout history, we believe that most of the killing in the battlefield didn't happen in the battle. The historical battles were just great shoving matches. But when one side turned and fled, then the killing takes place. So they're all turned around. You don't have to look in their faces. You don't have to look in their eyes. Uh, we've done everything humanly possible to enable a close-range kill. It is so cunning and ingenious and frightening. 
in, in the whole mechanism that was used to put in place. I must say that Oberleutnant Gnade did give me the impression he found the operation truly enjoyable. It's true that single members of the company were seized by some kind of bloodlust. Again, he knocked down two or three prisoners. People who normally have little to say discover their talent of playing the ruthless master. How is all this going to end? There's a payday for everything. That evening, an entertainment unit of Berlin policemen visited us as so-called front support. The unit included musicians and vaudeville artists. Its members had gotten wind of the forthcoming shooting of the Jews, so they offered their services and even explicitly wished to participate in the execution of the Jews. Often soldiers of the Wehrmacht who were passing by stopped and participated in the shooting for a bit. Regarding this execution, I can still remember that the SD people were drunk afterwards, so they must have received a special ration of schnapps. We policemen weren't given anything, and I know we were quite upset. I know that some people counted accurately how many people they shot. They boasted among themselves with the numbers. The totals of some comrades went into the hundreds. One of these policemen once showed me a cigarette case that was full of wedding rings. Where he got them from, he wouldn't say. I can well imagine. When the Jews had currency on them, the money was kept in the platoon cash box and used to buy us beer. There was an immense hatred towards Jews. It was revenge. We were after money and gold. No need to hush it up. The operation against Jews were profitable. Afterwards, we spent several days flattening banknotes we had confiscated from executed Jews. I don't know what happened to the money. It was packed into sacks and dispatched. At lunch, some comrades joked about what they had experienced during the operation. The stories told me that they had just completed a mass shooting. I must admit that it gave us a certain amount of pleasure when we got hold of a Jew that we could finish. We did not recognize a Jew as a human being. We were also aware the Jews had to be annihilated anyway. We shall rid ourselves of the last traces of any sentimental feelings for humanity. When I opened the door to the room, I saw that an SS man was lying on the bed and that he had a young, beautiful girl with him. Since this SS man couldn't tell me where Hauptsturmführer Finger was, I went into a second room. There too, I encountered a young girl with an SS man. Since I didn't get a proper answer from him either, I entered a third room. In this third room, there was an SS man lying on the bed without a uniform jacket but with his trousers on. Next to him, on the edge of the bed, sat a young, very beautiful girl, and I saw her stroking his chin. I also heard the girl say, Right, Franzl? You wouldn't shoot me, would you? I asked the SS man if this girl, who I assumed was a Jewess, really had to be killed. The SS man told me all the Jews would be killed. There wouldn't be any exceptions. Then I asked him about the girls I had seen in those rooms and what would happen to them. This s said essentially that it was tough. Sometimes they had the chance to hand these girls over to another firing squad, but usually there was not enough time for that. And they had to do it themselves. The Stanford Experiment. By a toss of the coin, 24 participants are divided into two groups, guards and prisoners. The guards are equipped with uniforms and trenchians. The prisoners wear frocks with numbers and are locked into cells. The guards soon begin to show sadistic behavior. They develop inhumane punishment for the prisoners. Several times, the experimenters have to intervene to prevent mistreatment. Four prisoners suffer emotional breakdowns. The experiment has to be interrupted prematurely. Uh, so I think this cluster of experiments on the power of conformity, the power of role adaptation, the power of deference to authority, uh, together give us uh, a sense of the group dynamic that is 
one key factor in explaining why people in these units became killers. Well, I think it's important that uh, we do the scientific work and then take a moment to step back and, and reassert the, the, the moral judgment and say, no, these things are wrong, no matter if we can understand them, no matter if they were inevitable, no matter if we say that most of us would have done the same thing under those circumstances, the actions are still wrong and we must still object. When I began my study, some of my friends said, don't do it. You'll explain psychologically what they did and therefore divest them of the evil, of the moral responsibility that they should have. I went into the study and I believe that we have to try to grasp what the motivations were for people who kill in order to take steps to prevent that in our own imperfect ways. At the same time, we have to keep in mind that people are responsible for what they did. And in that sense, true psychological work is a moral enterprise. You don't leave morality at the door when you probe psychological, psychologically for reasons of their behavior. Now, I think we have to distinguish between an historical explanation of why people behave the way they did and a moral framework in which people are responsible for their individual actions. The fact that not everybody killed, and we know that historically from the battalion, and in these experiments there's always a group of people that don't put the electric shock or don't go all the way, we know it is possible for people to say no. With the first truck, my hand shook as I fired. But you get used to that. With the 10th truck, I aimed calmly and shot confidently at all the women, children, and babies, thinking of the two infants I have at home and that these hordes would treat them in exactly the same way, if not 10 times worse. My dearest, kindest mom, Traudi and Hans Peter. Daddy has now been waiting for a letter since September 22nd, but unfortunately not. And Global gave me the order to operate the shooting of the children. I asked him who's Today supposed to carry out the shooting. The he answered the Waffen says. Yes. So uh, he objected. I told him they're all young men. How are we supposed to justify to them that they have to kill little children? Yesterday. Then he said, so take your men. Once again, I repeated, how could they do it? They have little children themselves. This tug of war went on for about 10 minutes, then I suggested that the Feld Commandant's Ukrainian militia execute the children. No objections to this proposal were raised on either side. Gathering berries, how perfect for them. What a treat. Incidentally, yesterday was Thanksgiving. I didn't feel entitled, in regard to Jewish women and children, to let these children grow up to become Avengers, who would kill our sons and grandsons. The only thing missing was the sauce, <laughs> but otherwise delicious. Even I spoke things. to one of the policemen and asked if it was difficult for him to carry out such an order. He said he had two children of his own, but he had gotten used to this kind of work. Well then, my dearest, beloved mom, with kindest greetings and many thousand kisses to all my darlings, your good daddy. I myself was in a very pleasant position, since I didn't have to kill babies with their mothers. The children I had to shoot were already big enough for their mothers to lead them by the hand. I particularly remember an incident with a little blonde girl who took me by the hand. She also was shot later. My goal was, and I succeeded, kill children only. It worked as follows. The mothers let the children by the hand. The soldier next to me would shoot the mother and I would shoot the child. Because for certain reasons I told myself that the child would not be able to live without its mother. In a way, redeeming these children who wouldn't be able to live without their mothers was a way of easing my conscience. 
Do the children always behave? Has Mukkale been studying hard? Has Volkmar stopped wetting his bed? Dagi must also learn to sit up straight at the table without leaning on her elbows. As a German girl, she'll travel the wide world once she's grown up. All the people will watch her and learn from her. After all, according to the will of fate, we Germans are the people of the future. From, from Hitler gaining power to the leader commanding them to make this, to them learning to divide it up into little pieces, to the, uh, to the, the, the overall triumph of Nazi Germany as they swept through the Europe. Uh, all these pieces come together to, to dismantle one by one all of the rules that we've lived with as a civilization and to say what is considered the ultimate bad, to murder a child, becomes the ultimate good. Uh, and and this, this is, this is the, the, the ultimate uh, uh, achievement of evil. Often the religious use of the word evil tries to instill in it some supernatural force beyond human control. But I don't see it that way. I see evil as a purely human expression, a human potential. Uh, and it's the expression of evil that we create as human beings and in human settings uh, that is our problem. Unfortunately, genocide is part of humanity, deeply human. I don't like when people say it's uh, unhuman, they were like animals. No, no, no. And I, would, I would dream that. I would dream that. I was always a person with a higher sense of duty. I can say with pride that however disagreeable their duties might be, my men have displayed a decent and upright attitude. They can look everyone straight in the eye and be fathers to their families back at home. Not only did the men discharge the difficult duty they were given faithfully and meticulously in every respect, but in terms of their conduct they also represented the best in soldiering. For example, during a social evening to which I invited them, they presented me with a donation of 15,150 Reichsmarks in cash. I sent the money to the Fund for Children of Murdered Ethnic Germans. We had the moral right and the duty to our people to kill this people that wanted to kill us. However, we did not have the right to enrich ourselves with just a single fur, a watch, one Reichsmark or one cigarette or anything else. We will not even allow a small rotten spot to grow or take root. All in all, we can state that we fulfilled this most difficult task out of love for our people. And we have suffered no damage to our innermost self, to our soul, to our character. As far as I remember, the gist of what he said was that the maltreatment of Jews he had witnessed was not to his liking. It was our duty to shoot the Jews, not to torture and beat them. The defendant should not be punished because of the acts against Jews as such. The Jews must be exterminated, none of the killed should be pitied. In Alexandria, however, he let himself get carried away and committed atrocities that are unworthy of a German man and SS leader. These assaults cannot be justified the way the defendant claims as rightful retribution for the suffering the Jews have brought upon the German people. According to paragraph 147 of the Military Penal Code, the defendant is liable for punishment. Most of you will know what it means when a hundred corpses are lying next to each other, when five hundred or thousand lie there. Having had to cope with that, and on top of it, with the exception of human weaknesses, having remained respectable, has made us tough. You can have faith in your dad. He always thinks of you and will not overshoot.
you do need a fanatical core of those leaders who create genocidal institutions like Auschwitz and Treblinka uh, or the Einsatzgruppen. And then you get what I call an atrocity producing situation where the situation is so structured that ordinary people can enter it, can enter that environment and be capable of committing atrocities because they internalize quickly the values and actions that are the norm in that environment. Yeah, I think we have to get away from a notion that guilt is a, is a zero-sum game. And so the more we blame Hitler, the less anyone else is responsible. Uh, that I think one has to look at the responsibility of each of these groups. Clearly, the primary responsibility is on the people with the greatest power uh, and the people that make policy and the people that create these institutions, and this would be Hitler and the Nazi leadership. Uh, nonetheless, that does not mean that people who are at the bottom, who are being drafted into service, who are being sent out there, don't have responsibility for what they themselves do. At the end, you can say that this man or this woman who is shooting a small child in front of everybody, she or he takes the responsibility. And I cannot accuse him, his mother, his father and his nephew. Okay, but at the end, he kills. If we suspend that responsibility, it's a catastrophe. By the way, I, I did not enjoy killing Jews. The SS Gruppenführer was a physician by profession, and he dealt with the assignments of psychological impact on his men. It turned out that the men, especially the leaders, were frequently not up to the demands of the job. The most primitive sadistic drive. Unbridled alcohol consumption. Some had nervous breakdowns. SS men who were assigned disorders. to execution squads had crying fits. We had suicides, for example, and others eventually lost control and began firing shots rampantly in all directions. Execution squads was temporary sexual impotence. I've just had a terrible night. How can only a dream be as true and expressive as reality? I've tried to suppress the images of the past, but I haven't succeeded. Oh, my mood is very gloomy. I have to pull myself together. The sight of the dead... Global is lying on his bed. Holding women and children is not very enlivening. Suffering from a nervous breakdown. I'm an emotional wreck again, just like I was back I went then. to see him. Global was there. He was talking gibberish. He said it was impossible to shoot that many Jews. The day's impression should be blurred by organizing social Dr. evenings. Zelensky suffers in particular from delusions relating to the killings of Jews that he commanded himself and relating to other traumatizing events in the East. I feel I'll never be able to achieve anything anymore. I wish I could ignore it and forget what I had to live through. The overwhelming attitude is self-pity. It was my bad luck to be assigned to a unit that had to do this dirty work. Poor me, how I suffered day by day doing these terrible, hard things. Almost no thought about what this meant for the victims. The guilt and the evil are so extreme, so grotesque, that you must block them out. Uh, sometimes we, we find the paradoxical state in which the survivor may feel guilt-like uh, emotions, uh, or at least self-condemnation. It has nothing to do with, uh, well, it isn't the same at all as legal or moral guilt. It's the feeling of guilt because he or she survived and others didn't, or because one didn't do more to stop the evil force. And the survivors may feel more of that than the perpetrators because the perpetrators are in the process trying to uh, avoid feeling what they were doing, avoid emotional involvement in what they were doing. I'm aware that men from these units ended up in asylums. We therefore had to find a new and better way of killing. I can't say whether I had misgivings about the use of gas in vans at the time. My primary concern then was that the killings represented a considerable burden on the men who were involved. Now we had discovered the gas and the procedure. I always dreaded the shootings when I thought of the masses, the women and the children. I was relieved that we would be spared all these bloodbaths. 
that also the victims would not have to suffer until the very last moment. During dinner, the Jewish question was discussed, both within the Generalgouvernement and around the world. It's very interesting for me to hear conversations like these. To my surprise, essentially everyone agreed that the Jews had to be wiped off the earth entirely. In his decrees, the Reichsführer SS has pointed out that Asia is located to the east of the German Reich, that Poland is also part of it, and that the Poles are subhuman. I can remember squadron instructions that took place in East Prussia. As the Oberstommannführer Otto held a lecture in which he told us that the Russians, Slavs and Jews are inferior people. He said one could kill these people without scruples and without any qualms of conscience. In the case of genocide, it is usually targeted in such a way that most people don't feel threatened. It's not at everybody. One of the key things of the Nazi regime, of course, is how the bulk of the people are in the Volksgemeinschaft. And it is Jews and gypsies and communists and disabled people on the fringes of society that are the people that will be targeted. Then you can organize people to break earlier rules uh, because they will still consider themselves law-abiding citizens. They wouldn't think of going over and robbing from their neighbor. They wouldn't think of knocking down an old lady in the street so she can get run over by a bus. But they can shoot hundreds of people in the target group. When you begin to classify people a little bit under you, it's the beginning of the genocide for me. It's the first step. It's why we fight also so much against racism. Because the key, without racism, Hitler couldn't do it. Even with the economic crisis. Because who to kill? Wherever we stand up for our German fatherland, we are proud to be able to help the Führer. The enormous significance of this time will only be understood by future generations. But we all want to withstand the test of history, full of pride, having done our duty. We, the men here at the front, will certainly take the right path. Our faith in the Führer fulfills us and gives us strength for our difficult and thankless duties. It has gotten late. I'll finish now, I'll... I send you all my regards and all my love. You're steady. Genocide is basically a, a political action, and it is the organizing of people to carry out a, a policy. In that sense, then, I don't think we change human nature, but I do think we can change political culture. Could this happen in the United States these days? Well, Milgram showed that people will go along with commands to carry out orders. So in that situation, uh, Americans would probably react not that differently from the Germans. However, would that situation really arise in the same respect? That I'm more optimistic that it could not. And that's why our ideologies and the political and military structures that we build become so important because Whatever we think of as human nature or as the human potential, we see that it has the possibility of going in either direction. Sometimes comrades refuse to take part in the killings, including myself a few times. Nothing happened to me, nor to the others who refused the order. There were no repercussions from our commanders. We were simply assigned other duties. There were no threats of any disciplinary measures, definitely not of executions. The Ash Conformity Experiment. Variation. If only one other participant gives a correct answer to the exercise, the subject then almost always insists on the right solution. I was not approached about these operations. The leaders took men with them on these assignments, and in their eyes, I was not a man. Other comrades who shared my attitude and acted as I did were also spared these assignments. Raschwitz yelled at me and insulted me. I can still remember the expression Austrian swine that he used for me. To my knowledge, he also used the term coward and other curse words. 
Among other things, Ahrens called me a cowardly sissy and the like. He accused me of unsoldierly conduct, etc. But to harden me up, he ordered me to stand guard right at the edge of the pit, the, the mass grave. I suppose Ahrens wanted to show me that a soldier must do everything he's ordered to do. In the end, he said derogatorily, he's not even worth to be put at that post. Milgram experiment. Variation. If the subject observes a stage procedure when the experiment is prematurely interrupted, the ratio of obedience is reduced by half. If two experimenters express different opinions about how to proceed, the level of obedience among participants is reduced to zero. It wasn't like when someone refused to carry out an order, he was immediately put up against the wall. That required much more serious demeanors. We would have been able to cope with difficulties. By difficulties, I mean that we were expecting to be reprimanded. However, I had the impression that I was overlooked in subsequent promotions. The only disadvantage I had as a result of my conduct was I had to serve more frequently as a guard than the others. And in addition, I was given much less free time. And as we sit in the Nuremberg trials, it became enmeshed into our culture that saying I was just obeying orders is never acceptable. Suddenly, across the NATO alliance, across NATO troops, in the very beginning, beginning, beginning with the Nuremberg trials, we, we began the process of, of, of saying we have to raise soldiers who will not just obey orders. And, and this is a big deal. I see the difficulties not only philosophically to change the way a nation thinks, but practically, how do you build a court which is going to hold people accountable and show them in their true light as murderers, not heroes? This was the tragic fulfillment of a program of intolerance and arrogance. Vengeance is not our goal, nor do we seek merely a just retribution. We ask this court to affirm by international penal action man's right to live in peace and dignity, regardless of his race or creed. The case we present is a plea of humanity to law. Why? Why only 24? For the ridiculous reason, only 24 seats. This theater is sold out. It's a ridiculous reason. Uh, but let's take the other extreme. You want to try all the murderers. I got 3,000 defendants. How long would it take to have a trial? Everyone is entitled to be presumed innocent, including Ollendorf and Goering, uh, until proven guilty in a court of law. And this is a principle which I adhere to as a Harvard lawyer. Uh, this is, to me, axiomatic. So. I have to choose the highest ranking people. And the other 3,000, what happens to them? Is that just? Of course it's not just. Are you going to have perfect justice? Of course you're not going to have perfect justice. Some of them came up for denazification proceedings. Some of them were never tried anywhere. They either disappeared in Argentina or someplace else. And even those against whom we prove beyond doubt that they played a key position, four were executed. And the rest of them, within a few years, were turned loose. Is that just? Of course not. It's unjust. So you don't have perfect justice. You have symbolic justice because you're aiming for the mind of the people. Is it important to have those trials? Of course it is. If you don't have the trials, you have no way of establishing the truth and showing the victims that you really care. For example, Jovka in West Ukraine. The 200-year-old synagogue is burned down. In a forest outside town, 3,500 people are shot.
the largest single mass execution takes place in Babi Yar near Kiev. 33,771 people are murdered within 36 hours. In Nuremberg, Otto Ohlendorf, the commander of Einsatzgruppe D, is convicted of murder in 90,000 cases. He defends himself by saying it was only 60 to 70,000 cases. In the mass executions in Eastern Europe, about two million people are murdered, one third of all Holocaust victims. What I'm describing is a human failing, which has happened again and again, and is happening as we speak. It is happening. Cruelties, innocent people are being killed all around the world because we have failed, failed, as in to build the institutions that we need, which are necessary to maintain a more peaceful order. Because for me, the challenge is for tomorrow. We must be in time. I wouldn't like that in 50 years, a movie is done about Darfur and said, how could I, because nobody moves. It, it isn't done only by teaching, by detached teaching, although we need some of that. It's also done by one's own ethical passions and contesting these destructive movements. Perhaps one day you will be policeman or military or scientific or journalist in a place of killing. This day you will have to do something. And I say at least take a picture and send to CNN. Don't wait the, politi the politician to move. Because politic machines are too slow. The time by United Nations and UNESCO and whatever or NATO decided to just it's finished for the victims.